Thank you, Sean. Well, we're looking out, and we're very impressed with those of you that actually made it today and didn't have too much to drink and actually managed to get a grab or, or use the public transport, which we've been discussing was the absolute best way to come. Um, so I'm delighted to be joined um, by these wonderful people. Um, you will note that this is quite industry agnostic, so it's not necessarily a specific tray, um, a, a specific stream. And we did that on purpose because we wanted to really get some practical elements of how can you lead through change, um, what happens when it goes wrong, how do you make it work, what's changing in the workplace. And I think every single industry that's out there at the moment is experiencing that change. So let's start with that because we do have some different industries represented across the panel. What is driving the change in your industry? Christine, maybe we can start with yourself. Sure. Um, I work in the media and entertainment industry, and I think what is driving, enormous, enormous disruption has been happening for the last sort of five years or so. The drivers are actually similar to a lot of the change that we're seeing across multiple industries. Is really technologically driven and around disintermediation of the aggregator or the, the service provider or the middleman. And uh, a shift in consumer behavior in terms of the demand for choice and control. Um, and so in my industry, which traditionally was a television business where we produce linear television uh, networks where people would have an appointment to view at 7 p.m. for the nightly news, um, we have found the shift, while we continue to operate many, many very successful television businesses, we have found that with the advent of um, the over-the-top technology that enables people to watch content uh, on the internet, on their mobile phones, through OTT services and on-demand pre- and subscription services, that our entire industry is being turned upside down. And it's a, it's a very exciting time to, to change too, because while you can hold on to the existing business, um, the growth is certainly flatlining, and we've spent the last five years really reinventing ourselves in, in it, to be able to participate in where our audience is now want to view content. Right. So technology and consumer choice, I mean, are they, are they hand in hand? Very much so, I think. You know, I, uh, in my day job, I work in a disruptor. I work at Grab. Um, but I also sit on the board of Starhub, which is a locally listed uh, telco. And that's in a terribly disrupted sector. <laughs> so I know, what it, I know yeah. what it feels like to be a disruptor, and I know what it feels like to be on the side of, you know, being disrupted. Um, you talk about television that's gone through so many cycles of disruption mm -hmm. and still going on. And, and clearly, it's, it's really the confluence of how new technologies are shaping and, and enabling new consumer behavior. And what the consumer wants, the consumer eventually gets. No matter what companies do, what the consumer wants, the consumer eventually will get. And if it's empowered by technology, somebody will find a way to satisfy that consumer. Yeah, someone mentioned to me before that they said the future is the consumer will get what they want, when they want, and then how much they want to pay for it, yeah. <laughs> which can be quite, quite scary. I, I, I echo both Christine and, and Lionel in, in my industry, which is about uh, b developing and creating events. Um, and now, nowadays, it's all about continuous engagement. Because of technology, um, we as customers and consumers demand and what we need, we want to get it now. It's an always-on situation, an always-on society. Now, that also imposes a lot of challenge, particularly on the workforce. Mm -hmm. And that, that's something where we look at a change, and we were wondering, how do you adapt to such changes? And it's not something that you can sort of take it out from a vending machine. <laughs> so it's the ability and the agility that needs to be uh, considered when you look at all these factors that change. So disruption and the disruptee, how do you then work together to make sure that you can harness the positive energy? It's not easy, but I think that's where change comes about. It's a process and it's a management of how do we bring about both companies and our customers and to ensure that continuous engagement is well um, carried out. I mean, there are external factors that are widely reported, and we're talking about those, but there are also internal factors in our, in our workforce changing, the mindsets of people changing. And I think, you know, it's, you can read a lot about how strategy and culture have to align to be successful or to get yourself through any sort of change assignment or, or just to run a great business, right? I mean, 
Anna, maybe you could give some examples of um, where you may have found that disconnect in, 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 in roles that you've had in the past and how you can get that on track. How do you realign that strategy and culture so that you can take it forward? I think that the biggest change we had um, you know, to do is to, to change the mind of the management. Um, the media business was always a very profitable business, pay TV business, and suddenly um, you need to, to uh, say no to those margins. You know, it's very difficult. <laughs> Um, and um, initially, when we were working uh, on the digital products, uh, we were thinking that, okay, if we take uh, one of our shows and we put it on the internet, it's going to be a total success. Uh, and everyone is going to pay one, two, three, four, whatever you call it. Um, but it wasn't the case. And um, our CEO was always like, we have this product. Um, in one year, I want to get one million subscribers, 10 million revenue. It's like, it's not happening. So uh, this shift was very, very difficult. Um, that in, you cannot get your margins that quickly. Um, that uh, you need to build the reach first uh, before you get there. Because when you look at uh, all the disruptors, uh, Grab, Facebook, all of them, well, Facebook is not a disruptor anymore. Um, <laughs> but uh, they had to build the reach first, right? And then they started monetizing it. So I think uh, that uh, it's the first step in your uh, strategy. And then, of course, you need to align the whole culture with it uh, and the whole thinking from up to down and down to up. For me, it's the main step. Yeah. Christine? Um, Talking about how we... I mean, I think the cultural element is really, is really important. And it also, that culture and the, the culture drives behaviors, right? And you need a framework around that. So this sort of affects your whole internal organizational structure and then how you drive that cultural change. So if you were in quite a, you know, um, this is what we need to achieve and it happens every year and that's great, you have a certain amount of, uh, mm. you have a, a certain culture. When you're damaged and you've got to change, you know, how do you then change your yeah. strategy to, or change your culture how do you, to fit how do you the strategy? Together. I think, I mean, for, for us, culture, leadership and strategy are, are really conscious and mapped out and, and they go hand in hand. I think we've moved from being a um, product centric organization to one that is consumer centric and if there's anything that sort of the experience of the transformation we've been under in the last sort of specifically five years here in Asia, but over the last decade, you know, given that we're, our parent company is Comcast, and, and they've really driven a, a lot of sort of the change. Um, it's been around the, the shift to consumer centricity. And so as leaders now, you know, we're looking for people who are um, you know, entrepreneurial and commercial, but consumer centric, and that really drives sort of strategy. Um, but you know, there are, it, it's it's multi pronged. There are so many pieces to the way that we have transformed. So one piece has been about you know sort of setting a vision and being firm on the vision, but incredibly flexible on the the tactical and the the way to get there. Piece, the way we get there. Um, the cultural piece again has been very um, a big focus of ours, both. In. And, and it's, it's a little, when you have a, an operating business, it's a really successful, a fairly sort of broad corporate business, but you also know you need to get there, which is in a really different direction. You don't want to, I think to Anna's point, you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater, but we still want to keep those very viable businesses operating. And we see that there's still, there's still reasonable longevity, particularly there's, there's in, in markets like Asia where there's still growth businesses. Mm. So it's like kind of, you've got to like steer the big ship in a different direction because you continue to want to, to, to monetize your assets in a traditional way, but at the same time, sort of underneath, there's all this paddling going on under the water, which is around the constant innovation that we're seeing. You know, we've needed to, to, as I said, to shift it to the consumer focus, but, but in that, we've had to really create diversification. So we've moved from being a television business to one that operates SVOD and AVOD services, with digital publishing, you know, e-commerce, mm -hmm. um, direct-to-consumer apps. There's a, there's a broad portfolio of products now that our organization operates. And, and, and we haven't stopped doing the business as usual part. Yeah. And we're now looking at further adjacencies. And if you redefine yourself as being in the business of meeting a consumer need, so instead of saying, I'm in the TV business, I'm in the business of 
delighting, entertaining, educating an audience, then there are so many other businesses and adjacencies we should be thinking of. And we've moved you know, to esports, into education, into a number of other sort of areas. And Aloysius, I know that when you first went into Sing X, I mean, I don't want to be disrespectful to the role, but it was, you had a box, and it was managing a box, right, in terms of the exhibition centre. But then you've gone through incredible change in terms of diversifying your uh, business areas, product offerings. Um, t tell us a little bit about that journey. <clears throat> I think uh, when you have a roof on your head, that's your limit to growth. <laughs> so either you are mm. happy with it, or with, with this whole vortex of change and possibilities coming about, how do you then uh, seize the emerging business opportunities? Uh, I think therein lies what are your adjacencies, what are your new enterprise platforms, what are your new sort of ballasts for growth that you need to, to look at. So we move into uh, the event space whereby you look at creating new platforms that play at the intersection of industries. And that's what we see in disruption. Minimally, you're going to get technology with, uh, with a vertical. So whether it has to do with um, agri-food tech or whether it's going to do with fintech, anything with X tech. <laughs> so, <laughs> So deal with it. But the question is, there are many more opportunities around. And when you, you talked about structures and culture, and the question is, if typically organizations are very hierarchical, how do you sort of um, match hierarchies with the need to be responsive and put customer at the center? Where does agility play out? And yet, in Asian cultures, as you know, we tend to be a little bit more different, and, and we tend to listen to the boss and the like, and the boss know it all. But no one has monopoly of wisdom. The whole idea is how do you nurture and how do you bring that about? And a lot of nudges, a series of nudges, a series of really rolling out your sleeves, going down to the trenches, and trying to see and encourage. I think that's where we need to create a groundswell. And that can only be done if you need to be perhaps humble. You need to come down and in, not sitting on your throne and dictating. I think those days are, are gone and you see the disruptors, whether it's Grab or any others. You, you're looking at how do you activate the ecosystem of players mm. and how do you then corral all the resources that you have and seek alignment. Mm. And what I found out is alignment is very key. It's about, yes, you have a vision, it's going to be a stretch, but you also want to make sure that personally you are aligned to the goal. Now that, it's like, you, you can't change it. It's bringing the horse to the river and he or she needs to drink it at his or her pace and her own time. And that's something we need to nurture. Mm. It's not easy, but I think if you have that um, focus and discipline, you're able to actually make well, great things happen. So I find that a, a burning platform, you know, being very clear what that burning platform is, is a very important precondition for change to have traction. Um, most organizations, I think, fall into one or two categories, right? You are in an emergency crisis mode, you need to go to A&E, you need immediate triage and urgent intervention. I think the burning platform in those situations are quite clear. <laughs> but many organizations are in a, well, you know, things look okay, they could be better. Well, what's the burning platform? Right? And I think that's sometimes where the role of leadership becomes really important. Being able to articulate what the burning platform is and being able to then cascade that message down throughout the organization. And then even, even when you have identified that, there's a whole art involved in managing that change, right? Because if you are in a okay situation, not crisis situation, how do you convince people that they need to get from A to B? They even need it. Right? Yeah. And, and the approach that I found which is, um, has been useful is think of it in terms of a journey which is evolutionary in process but revolutionary in outcome. Mm. Meaning, on a day-to-day -day basis, on a week-to-week -week basis, we're taking steps, small steps, you know, and we can, we can articulate what those goals are on a weekly, monthly, quarterly basis, and they look manageable for most of the people in the organization. That's evolutionary in process. But after a year or two years, when you look back, you go, oh my goodness, look at the ground we've covered. You know, it's almost like a different organization. Mm. 
I think sometimes that kind of approach, but being able to steward the organization through that approach, that's the art of, of leadership. That's very good advice. We, know, we would be overwhelmed, can't well, you? I remember we were talking earlier about um, the, you know, what about, all, what about not changing? Is there a whole change for change's sake? Are people thinking we need to change their own? You know, my, my feeling, to, even without the burning platform, is you absolutely have to change, even if you don't think you need to. It needs to be constant change. I think the, the, the most dangerous thing in any organization now is, is believing that you can rest, that, that you can just continue to do what you're doing. If you're not challenging yourself every day, if you're, if you're not challenging each other within an organization, um, there's, there's opportunities for you know, processes and systems and behaviors to become entrenched, for you not to see other things. There's silos create, mm. you know, interrelationships sort of that, that foster a certain sort of dynamism organization that misses the opportunity for adaptability and flexibility and maneuverability. So the, the need to continue to change within an organization, I think, is critical. But, but how do you get people there? Because some people will need to be dragged kicking and screaming into that new age, and some people will dive in and be in incredibly excited about it. So I think um, that... You know, for yes, people, I don't know why today they think like, oh, we live in the world of disruption. But when you think so, disruption was always there. I mean, it's like the creator of, um, um, you know, car. I mean, it's like the, the whole world changed, right? And it's like the whole 20th century was a permanent disruption. Mm -hmm. Every in, in everything, in technology, I don't know, telephones, whatever. It's not that suddenly we woke up. It's like, oh, we're in disruption, right? So but we um, love saying it. The word is used every day: disruption, disrupted, and innovation. Yeah, I mean, it's just okay. There are new definitions. Maybe before we used other words. Yeah. Uh, but but that's it. Um, the truth is that I think that maybe uh, some people are really into the comfort zone, and it's really difficult uh, to explain to them that the change is actually good. Uh, you know, there's this famous book, uh, Who Moved My Cheese, right? It's all about that. Um, but um, the change is an opportunity for you to get uh, somewhere uh, further, or, you know, change your life, change the place, change your husband, whatever you whatever you want, right? It's never Anna. always for bad. I like that one. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <I> support us in... <laughs> So you shouldn't always look at the change as something bad and as a catastrophe. So I think this is a message that we need to send as the leaders, that it's, it's change, but it's also an opportunity. The and same is when people leave your organization. It's also an opportunity to bring uh, new blood and new vision, right? Um, the new products. But even when something happens, when you lose startup, for example, you know, uh, you wake up because you need to develop uh, your new uh, business stream. And it's all small changes and big changes, right? There's a million small changes that happen incrementally as well as the broader yeah. things. I think, you know, as a leader in the environment that we're in, I think it's just critical be a transformational leader and so you are you are it's change management is what you do and that you communicate I think you mentioned that you communicate and over communicate and communicate at all levels of the organization you have people who will move very slowly and in incremental ways you bring in people from outside the industry or the organization who will be change makers it said like 10 15 percent of an organization are generally change makers you identify those people and they will lead teams in different ways. There's, I think there's strategies and tactics on so many levels across people and product and culture that need to be together. So it's not really a one great big sweep that disrupts. I think we are talking before, it's, it's, there's a managing change of being a transformation leader potentially in Asian businesses is nuanced um, because culturally there tends to be less desirability about stepping out from a peer group and, and certain things. And um, the, again, it's why it's very important to, as a leader, not to be command and control a transactional leader, but to really to inspire and to bring people along the journey with you. I just wanted to say that I, I completely agree with Anna's point that change has always been with us. Um, the one caveat, though, I think what has changed about change is that the rate of change has been increasing. You know, so what used to come, you know, maybe one in a generation or one in half a century, we're now seeing one in five years, right? And you see that playing out as well in the workforce. Um, 
because of the, the different ex lived experiences of the different generations that you have in the workforce. So very often uh, you get feedback that you know, the 40-year-old employee um, can relate quite well with the 60-year-old employee. But when relating to the 20-year-old employee, it's almost like they came from a different planet. Mm. You know? And that's because it's the same 20-year generational gap, but so much has happened mm. you know, that the lived experiences of these two individuals are so different. Um, you know, it's just so hard to, and, and therefore, when you think about a, a B2C um, business, then you look at your consumer segments, you know, hey, Starhub still has a lot of loyal, you know, cable TV consumers, but you know which demographic they're in. Right. Let me just pick up on a little ageism there. The, uh, <laughs> Even if you're above 40, you can understand those 20-year-olds. Um, I'm so the, glad you brought that up. But actually, but no, but it's really important. It is really an important thing to, to understand. What you do need to be as a leader is curious. You need to be curious. You need to look at the data. You need to totally understand that the generation who are your audience or your consumer, or your constituent, may not be you, and they generally are not you. And so understanding both, in, in my case, my employees as well as our audience's values, their sense of purpose, their, what they're desiring out of their work or their product, which are very, very different than me, is simply a matter of understanding the data and, and being very, very you know, immersed in the, the business and, and curious about what's going on. Mm. And, and it's an understanding of, of mindsets and approach rather than just, oh, that's a millennial, it's a disaster, mm. because actually it's not, right? And you mm. can have people with that same mentality at any stage of their career to a certain extent. You know, if I can chime in, um, what was mentioned, you talk about the velocity and vortex of change. Today's world, if you are standing still, you're moving backwards. Mm. And that's, that's the new normal. And therefore, change doesn't matter whether it's big or small. It's how do you manage, and we alluded to it about bite-sized changes. How do we manage? How do we, how do we put it in the new consciousness of everybody? Now, that's something that needs to be thought through. Mm -hmm. And residing in any of our functional groups in organizations, today's fuel is about information and data. And what if you're able to break info silos, information silos? What if you can just reach out to your colleague or to your team, ask questions? You, you'll be able to learn more, gather more, learn more skill sets. You are beginning that effort of change. I think that sort of... Um, 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 consciousness would be would be mm. important to start mm. off with, and I, I firmly believe when you stand still t in today's world, you know you're just seeing things moving by so fast. How are you going to to grab hold of it? But not everybody can cling on to it or can ride the waves, right? You need to have that um, different strokes for different folks. Mm. Then it's important to then see how do you calibrate. That's extremely exacting uh, demand on leadership, management, and the organization. Mm. But at the end of the day, just cut out the clutter. Let's bring down to start small, look at bite size, and, and start working on it bit by bit. Yeah. And as I think Lionel was mentioning, then after two years, you say, whoa, what a whirlwind of change we went mm. through, unbeknown to everyone. But actually, we were part of the journey. Mm. I think that's the whole thing today. We need to seed and grow. And you need to be quite deliberate at that point to say, look what we've done. Yeah. It wasn't that scary, was it? And we can yeah. do it again. I mean, if we, I mean, there's a sort of broad growth, uh, a broad change element, which we all know we've, we've got to be um, transformational change leaders. But there are also short-term changes changes and projects and change assignments that you need to, to deliver to get to the goals, as we were talking about. Let's get negative, all right? What have you really messed up? Be honest. Or what have you seen? Oh, obviously, no, everyone's perfect on my panel. Um, or what have you seen where it's gone wrong? You know, what are the common themes of, of when a change assignment or a, a desire to move into something new has gone wrong? We, um, we're not agile enough, um, and uh, sometimes I say to the team, if we're not going to do that, someone else is going to do that. So we need to move very quickly. Um, it was very difficult for us uh, to try and fail. 
For example, uh, we launched Discovery Kids platform here in the region and we shut it down three months later, which I agree totally with, uh, because the platform uh, didn't belong to us. And if you want to run the proper products, you need to own the platform. I'm absolutely um, sure about it. So, um, okay, it didn't work out, but for me, it wasn't a failure. It was a chance to create something else. Uh, we're building now a new platform, lifestyle product, uh, but we're launching it in November. If it's going to fail, okay, it was an experience. We will try something else. We still have some free cash flow, uh, you know, to spend, uh, and we'll try uh, until it's not going to, to work out. Um, but I think that um, kind of back to our previous discussion, indeed, uh, the belief of people, um, sometimes it's not obvious. Sometimes they just uh, give up on you. So it's like, okay, I'm just going uh, to the more stable business or I'm going completely out of this business uh, because it's FMCG and they think it's not disrupted, which is being disrupted as well. Um, so it's difficult uh, to um, you know, uh, keep this fire in, in people, um, and it's the most uh, challenging part of it. I wouldn't call it a failure, though. And I, I would also say, Helen, that 50% um, of change initiatives fail. I think that failure is something we need to celebrate, and it's one of the pieces, I think, that we've really, in terms of transforming our culture, we've really been very also very deliberate about. We need to give our, our incredibly creative, talented teams the ability to experiment, to innovate, and to fail, to fail frequently and fast and forward. Um, and so we've got to define failure as success because that means we're trying new things and we're experimenting and we're being entrepreneurial. And if we don't do that, um, then we're not going to be around in the future. So but, by the way, is Google, right? Google, we just see all the uh, uh, beautiful stories, but there are a lot of products that they tried yeah. and they failed and they didn't uh, uh, see the light. Yeah. Uh, so this is uh, the, the right approach. But many organizations will have to be quite creative about that and ensuring that you know, it isn't going to massively affect their bottom line. Mm. Um, and so sort of bringing that, I guess, into smaller projects every day to day, that it's OK. But people are afraid. I mean, if you've got a very dictatorial leader and mm. a transactional leader, it's tough. And if you look at organizations that, that fail to change, and thus I would suggest they're going to fail as, as, as businesses, it's usually around exactly that. It's around um, stakeholders not being engaged, about you know shareholders, senior management sort of not being engaged in the change. It's about lack of investment, lack of commitment of resources. Um, it's about like, lack of communication appropriately of what we're doing and the celebration of failure because of where it's leading us. Yeah. So there's there's, there's, a, there's a need at all levels of an organization to understand the process of change for it to be successful. But it, it is, you know, I think to Lyle's point, it's accelerated and it's continuous as part of our so everyday lives now. My observation is that most organizations do not behave like startups. <laughs> uh, and therefore, instead of a bias for change, there is a bias for you know, status quo. Yeah. Um, and so the, most of the time, the regrets that people have is that they didn't do it fast enough yeah. or they didn't set a high enough bar, an ambitious enough target. Um, not fast enough, not big enough. That's right, that's right. Whereas for the startups, you know, because they have everything to play for and maybe at an early stage very little to lose, it's just going all in, right? Um, but most organizations don't behave like that. Um, and, when, and, and my own reflection, um, six years in the Singapore Tourism Board is, and, and I led both the STV as well as the industry through a period of change, but even then, my own reflection is, you know what, I could have done it even faster and harder. Okay. But you know, uh, one of the things uh, we have to implement here now in the region is to work as a startup, um, which is great. It's a new energy to the team. Um, before we used to look at like monthly uh, results, now it's daily results. Um, and we uh, do things much quicker. Uh, we take the decision much quicker. Uh, and it's a completely uh, new mindset. For me, it's a big learning uh, path because uh, there are many things I don't know. And I ask silly questions. Uh, but yes, uh, it's, it's also part of my change uh, as a leader. And I think it's great for the team to see that I behave myself um, as a learner because they l uh, learn together uh, with me. And I had a very interesting question from one of my team's members. Uh, she asked me if I was afraid because we are now building this platform. And she's like, are you afraid? 
And I, you know, I said like, yeah, of course I am afraid. Of course, I, you know, to deliver, you you invest money, uh, but without trying, um, you, you cannot fail. And um, this fear is a part of the change. But I think, yeah, you should you should have it, you know, to challenge yourself. And that's interesting to delve into. So how we're talking about change. How have you changed as a leader over the last few years and in this change environment? Before that, I just want to add on, many um, companies in, in Singapore and Asia are SMEs. And when we look at SMEs, you, you also have to look at your P&L and you also need to look at change. So there is both a fear, there's also a time factor. And sometimes you need to think about how are you going to manage this whole change process? And let's assume that you know what change is and that you have worked out your vision and your game plan, you got your priorities and objectives right. But if you're an SME, you've got your, whether you have a board or whether you, you are looking at how do I manage short-term needs with long-term growth, mm -hmm. right? I, I may not have Series A, B, C funding. I may, I need to find out how, oops, I need to find out where is my next source of revenue and who is actually having my lunch or dinner, or whichever it is, <laughs> uh, where my competition is, who is creeping up, who is pulling the rug under my feet. So there is that sort of but. tension and, and need to balance these different factors. Now, when you have changed, and the question is, how do you know when the timing is right? Sometimes you might be too early for change. Well, of course, late. Is it true? Um, and as, as, as you pointed out, Anna, which is about um, the Discovery Kids, may, and that's trial. But in an organization where you have such capacity, some mistakes are allowable. But when you're an SME, that can be really costly. Mm. So I think that's something which we need to bear in mind when you ask it. For me, it's, it's an SME by and large. Um, what have changes? for me to be extremely discerning and do my due diligence really well. Mm. I think the robustness and rigor needs to be there because I can't fall back on anything else. So we therefore need to know, and, and plus, you need to rally your team. You know, if you rally a team, you have the P&L goal, the shareholder is, is pressing on you, your margins are affected, your competition is coming in. <laughs> Holy shit. So, oh, do you need to lie language? down? Yeah, <laughs> I do, I've to hear that. But I th uh -huh. therefore, I think self-reflection-wise, it's important to know yourself. Mm -hmm. I think that that's key as, as a leader, and it's what I've learned, is to know what can you do best. Where are your pitfalls, where are your weaknesses? How do you augment it? Mm -hmm. And that's why I mentioned the word humble. Uh, it's a very humbling experience. I think that's something that uh, we we need to bear in mind, and for me, I need to bear in mind too. And because at the end of the day, if you are authentic, if you're sincere about it, and people see you're trying your darnest best, I think that is going to be pretty powerful. And I think that's going to rally the team behind, come what me. So I think those are the things which I thought I'll share. Thank you. I mean, we had a very interesting discussion backstage about authenticity, but then sometimes, you know, having to put on a persona, so you've got to keep that authenticity straight. But, I mean, what, how have you changed as a, as a leader over the last couple of years? Are you showing that vulnerability? Do you think that's the right thing to do? I mean, I, I think that I've constantly changed as a leader. If I look back at when I was, you know, when, when I was sort of rising in my career as an executive, it was also a time where I think probably that transactional kind of leadership was more we what we were doing. Organizations were more hierarchical. It was a lot more about sort of setting goals, looking at outcomes, about command and control, about really external motivations for employees. So we set performance targets, we measured against those and everything was very externally driven. Um, and I must say I found myself a little more, if I reflect on that, I was probably doing a lot more of that's how I have to be to do that and I, and, and I was able to. Um, 
I have found that now, again, I'm working for a large multinational corporation, but we have a very entrepreneurial business that's highly innovative, and we are able to operate on, on the two levels. We have a business as usual, sort of large, larger scale business, and we have a lot of sort of innovation happening and, and startup businesses within the organization. And we have evolved to be successful as transformational leaders. And th the evolution of me has gone along with that evolution of what's happened in the world. And, and that's through upskilling myself. And I, I think that, that all of us as leaders now, we're all on learning curves, right? We upskill ourselves. I've had to become incredibly digitally literate. You need to be technologically savvy. You need to be creative. And you need to have, and I, I think I've probably found my home in the world of transformational leadership because it is critical to be truly authentic and to have empathy and to, while continuing to have a vision for the business and manage a P&L, to be very, very people focused. And so we've moved into a world where our employees now are Gen Z sort of, you know, talent. And they are, they are striving to, for certainly career growth, but they demand organizations with purpose. They have a set of values that don't necessarily um, focus on you know, rising up a corporate ladder, but, but doing meaningful work and being part of community and, and you know, just a really different set of values. So as a leader, you need to be able to change and adapt. And certainly this, the, the area that we find ourselves now where transformation is part of your leadership and everything we do, um, I found it's the right place for me. But when you're working in markets that have historically um, responded to hierarchical leadership and sometimes empowerment just scares the bejesus out of them um, and can't cope with ambiguity. How do you, and we all know we need to, to get there, but how do you take a team like that that has it really you know, entrenched in their, in their culture and in their behaviors that they've, they've been working with, how do you take them into that looser area? Well, I think, you know, culture, what is culture? It's about norms, right? So if you have to change culture, you need to start thinking in terms of how do you start changing the norms in this community, in this organization? What gets, what, 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 kind of, what kinds of behavior are, are approved and what kinds of behaviors are frowned upon? Because um, I find that sometimes just to talk at the level of culture is not particularly edifying because what's the action item for me? You know, I need to break it down to what kinds of behaviors do we want to see in the team, in the organization, right? Mm -hmm. What is going to get a tick of approval and what's going to be uh, frowned upon? And I think you need, that's a process which um, needs to go through. I don't think, I think um, in many workplaces today, you, you do have a very multicultural milieu. Um, and that's an additional challenge, if you like, for organizational leaders. Um, but it does mean that you, know, you need to over-communicate, you need to engage, and you need to get that alignment um, within that community, within that team, in order to get the changes and the new norms can, can then emerge. And again, it happens in little bits and big bits, right? There are going to be people in an organization, 15% of them, who are change makers. Identify them. Make sure that you're empowering them to drive change. We build cross-functional sort of multidisciplinary groups that work on projects where people from all parts of an organization who are interested and, and able can come together and, and be part of innovative change. There are some and people... you need to give them ownership as well. And ownership, and absolutely. You need to upskill. You need to do a lot of... Yeah. Sort of, you know, training and development as well. It's really got to happen on a number of levels, and That's some right. people move faster and some slower. I never start but with the premise that everybody gets it from day one. Yeah. You always start with the ten percent or twenty percent mm. that gets it faster than the others, mm. and you know they are the they are the pathfinders, mm. and you need to make sure they are seen. That's the kind of behaviour you want to reward. That's, That's the right. kind of, you know, uh, activities you say. Yeah, we should all be like Tim, right? Because yeah. Tim is the ten or twenty percent who got it. And you need to celebrate people, really, for every single win, whatever is it you just... A lot of celebrations. Celebrate people, celebrate failure, celebrate yeah, projects, yeah, celebrate, celebrate yeah, a lot. Yeah. It's just one long party and your job, <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think what we've seen as well is it's, you really have to know people. I mean, that sounds ridiculous, but... And, and as a leader, you can't know 
everyone. I mean, you might be leading to thousands and thousands of people. So it's about really um, empowering and encouraging and ensuring that your, your, your other leaders within the business are knowing their people and not and developing them and really caring for them and being authentic about that. So many times we see um, our clients say, oh, that's HR. HR do that. So, no, no, no. HR put a process in place and a framework. You have to do that. You have to know them. Otherwise, you don't know how quick they can move or what their strengths are or what to work on, and then it all starts to crumble. I mean, talking as we come to the end, um, let's look to the future. So what does this amazing future leader look like? What do you think are the um, important traits or character elements um, uh, that are going to take businesses into the future with technology, um, obviously going pace of, a, a huge pace of change. Um, a lot of jobs going and going to be automated. Um, one thing that I saw, which um, is a great stamp sound bite, I'm sure people may have heard it before, leaders must stay human in a digital world mm. and not forget that er element. Um, but what, what do you see in the future? No, see, uh, I see a series of quotients. You have emotional caution, digital caution, cultural caution, and and you can continue. So you, you need to, I think you need to to be true to yourself, and I think a leader will also need to have that belief that change, that people can make the difference, and it doesn't matter whether the pathfinders, the top 10, 20 percent, or the bottom 10, 20 percent, celebrate the human spirit. And I think that's where. It can even be my auntie cleaning the floor or someone who is heading big markets. Um, they are bringing value. I think that's something where, and change happens and it, change does not discriminate. I think that's something which we need to, to think about. And therefore, how do you bring about a nurturing uh, environment? How do you create safe zones for people to fail and fail fast, learn fast? And, and not be ridiculed or sort of um, you know, um, uh, labelled wrongly. Mm. So I think that, that's that safe zone. And the last part, I think, it's for us to have the ability to ask the right questions. That, that's quite tough because sometimes you think you, you want a yes or no answer, but you have to restrain yourself to say, OK, bite your tongue <laughs> and courage. Simple things like this, you'll be amazed at some of the talent and perhaps the gems that are already residing in, in our colleagues. Yeah. So it's about asking the right questions. Sounds simple, right? But it's not that easy. Because sometimes we want to move fast, we want to make change happen quickly, we want to seize opportunities quickly. And, and sometimes in that you've already answered it for them, yeah. And then we'll find that, whoa. If you can't go through that process and you can't have a robust exchange, then you know you have not made change, uh, we've not maximized the value of change. Okay. And for me, it's all about listening. You really need to listen uh, very carefully uh, for your partners, for your team, and do not ignore because uh, how many leaders do we see when they have the meetings, they're on the phone or, you know, because their PA is just showing something, they're like, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> so you really need to listen uh, carefully. Indeed, uh, uh, stay uh, human accessible uh, and uh, ready uh, ready to change permanently. It's not that today you reach your seat level or whatever PhD level that that says game is over you, you need to continue uh, working on yourself and on your skills I think that um, I think that future leaders are going to be more generalists I think it's a real shift that I'm seeing in, if I look at the uh, at trends I think generalists are going to be leaders I think you need to be a generalist you need to be creative um, technologically sort of you know literate and savvy clearly but sort of commercial commercial and entrepreneurial but that Generalism is sort of a new piece that I'm seeing. Yeah. I see the future of leadership as being distributed and networked. And, and the implications for us, therefore, is to move away from a model where we see that some people are leaders and others are not. Because in that future where leadership is distributed, everybody is a leader, okay. everybody is empowered, everybody wants to be, uh, wants to have that sense of agency. And technology is going to, you know, push us in that direction because everybody, every individual is going to be much more empowered um, to act as an individual agent. Um, people in leadership roles probably 
probably need to start thinking of themselves as what Barack Obama calls community organizers, mm. right? Versus follow me, I know the way. I'm a community organizer. I think on this particular task, on this particular project, you know, I can help coalesce, bring together a group of people to achieve something. Yeah. Um, and I think, again, it, it's interesting because to me, it, it brings us full circle back to the wisdom of a Chinese philosopher, Lao Tzu, from over 2,000 years ago. And, and he talked about leadership as being one where at the end of the journey, you know, the, the people go, oh, we did this ourselves because the leader was invisible. The, the people didn't even realize there was a leader. Like, did we even have a CEO? <laughs> but, but we got there, we got from A to B, you know, and, and we were all leaders in our own right. And in that sense, it's distributed, it's networked. Um, there are still key roles that people need to play within a team. And like I said, it's about, you know, how do you sort of organize a community? And how do you sort of uh, coalesce like-minded people together? Um, but I think that's the direction we're trending towards yeah. for the future. It's interesting. A lot of the research that our company has done um, leads to the fact that the great leaders of the future will be the best facilitators, which is exactly as you say, in a virtual world. Mm. Um, so you've got that human element. You've got that facilitation. Um, but one of the key traits of being a leader, particularly through change, is being brave. Um, I'm wondering if there's anyone in the audience brave enough to post a question. Question for our wonderful panel here. I can't see anyone. There's a hand up there. Down the central aisle. Hello. Can you hear me without a microphone? Oh, yes. Where, where's my microphone? That's terrible of them. You can take mine. <laughs> Hi, um, Owen Lead from the Badminton World Federation. The question is about recruitment. In, in, in a world of continuous change, in a world of leadership who need to be generalists, how do you recognize specifically the right traits when recruiting especially senior management who might be quite stuck in their ways? Thank you. That's a good question. Um, you know, uh, one of the changes I had to face uh, before I answer your question is that um, um, t uh, TV media was always a very sexy industry. People were like, oh, you work for TV, and now they're like, oh, you work for TV, okay, fine. You know, uh, you have uh, much sexier organizations uh, there. What's the TV again? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> well, this was StarHub, uh, you know. <laughs> Um, so um, it's indeed uh, difficult to bring um, people, um, more difficult to bring people in and also to bring senior people to know that uh, they're not uh, stuck. I think um, it's a, um, either you, you get them through reference or you see someone really depressed uh, by someone's uh, job and you want to have this uh, person on board because you can see that the person share your ideas. I don't think it's about interviewing in an old time uh, you know, uh, ways. I think it's really more creative uh, research. And if you see that the, that is the wrong fit, you need to, to take a decision also very quickly. Don't try to put uh, this person on board if it doesn't work. I think you see it rather quickly. Anyone else? Well, um, I'm going to stick my neck out here and say that I think even for senior management roles, you're going to see uh, more of these people coming through the gig economy which means that you're going to have an opportunity to interact with them um, first as someone who is doing a gig for you. Um, and, and because it's a huge commitment to take on that permanent hire at a senior role, if you're not sure, if you're not sure that that person is, is right for you. So I would say if there's an opportunity to you know, engage with that person you know, on a gig, and, and that's so many of those are, are these days. Um, I think that's a good way of sort of exposing that person to the organization as well as exposing the organization uh, to that person. Um, and then you, you can make an assessment about 
um, whether this person is a, is a right fit for you. Because I, I, I completely agree with you. I think it's a, it's a, it's a huge decision. Um, and you don't want to, it's a high stakes one. And you don't want to, um, you don't want to go in uninformed. And you need to find ways and avenues where, you know, people can have working sessions together um, so that people can test out that chemistry. Mm. And I just think you stop looking for people who have done it before, which is what we used to look for, right? The, the things on the resume that they've done, and we don't now. It's, we're really looking for people who are entrepreneurial, who are commercial, who have shown that they're creative thinkers, who have shown that they can communicate well and who fit our culture. Yeah, you have to be brave in hiring yeah, going indeed. forward, yeah. and, and that's a challenge. You know, it's not the age old, no one gets fired for buying an IBM. Mm. You know, no one gets fired for getting a great exec who's been in the industry before. Mm. Um, but you do need to be much braver in that hiring and focus on the human. Mm. Or internal, or you move someone uh, internally. Mm. Yeah. Well. It's a great opportunity for people, right? If we know them and we've developed them well. Mm. Um, any other questions? You've got to be incredibly brave because you have to walk up here and, There's another one. and get the microphone. <laughs> you have to come and claim your microphone. Come and claim. <laughs> We're just sharing and caring on the stage. Thank you. Um, well, um, uh, I was listening, uh, listening to the conference. It seems like um, the future of the world is world of change, changes, right? Um, I'm just wondering, um, is there any um, thing that's constant constant something that don't change underneath that you all are searching for that you know motivates you through all the changes and you know something that you can feel bad on during failures yeah mm. what's the question what's constant what, what's there's something constant, constant. Okay. what's constant with all this change going on why, 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 why would you want to change <laughs> Hi, why, would you want why would you want to change? <laughs> here we go. If we don't change, we're not going to sit here next year. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the world has changed. But I think we started the, 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 the session with that. Because of technology and because of consumer behavior, the world has changed. And it's disintermediating the way we formerly did business. So I think that's unequivocal. And the, the acceleration of change also, I think, is, is clear. The thing, that's constant, I mean, the thing that's constant that I would say is that our job is still to make money. The end of the day. Um, we, you know, we, we are reinvesting in a different way than we used to. We're, we're, we're shifting our perception of margins with traditional businesses. We're looking at sort of longer term sort of break even for new businesses and all of that. But we're still in the business. We're a commercial enterprise. And the thing that hasn't changed is we need to make it successful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's a good point. I think for me personally, I, I draw an equation between change and learning, Christine talked about learning curves and growth, right? If, if there's no change, there's no learning, there's no learning, there's no change. And if there's no learning, there's no growth. If there's no growth, you die. If you don't want to die, keep growing, keep, going. keep changing, <laughs> and keep learning. Thank you so yes. much, Lionel, for that. <laughs> point. Um, please join me in thanking my wonderfully authentic and human panel of leaders. Thank you. Thank you.